Let's talk Utah Jazz basketball. Obviously, last night, not the outcome that most people wanted, um, but it feels like losing to the Dallas Mavericks, getting eliminated in, in the uh, NBA playoffs early on was inevitable for this Utah Jazz team. And perhaps the silver lining is changes begin now. Mm-hmm. And the biggest question is, what changes do you want to see? What changes will actually happen? We're going to talk about that in about five minutes, but I want to start with talking about this game and just how many examples of the flaws of this team were on display. Whether that be the inability to hit a three-point shot, Quinn Snyder draws up the perfect out-of-bounds play to get Boyan Bogdanovich a wide-open look from three, and he wasn't even close. And maybe that's the story of this season, that the Jazz simply could not live up to their identity And running it back with this roster was probably the wrong thing to do. You could also look at the Mike Conley situation. Mike Conley making 20 plus million dollars. You paid the luxury tax to bring him back. Mm -hmm. And he traveled. In one of the biggest moments of his Utah Jazz career, Mike Conley turned the ball over. And a lot of people asked the same question that I asked. Why is Donovan Mitchell passing that ball? He was not under double team. He was not under pressure. And yet he gave that ball up to Mike Conley, and Mike Conley promptly turned it over. Mm -hmm. And now you did get a second look there to try and win that game, Jake. But I feel like those situations were the perfect example of the flaws that this Utah Jazz team were dealing with all season long. Yeah, I, I thought last night's game was was very on brand for the Utah Jazz. You know, and and I think whether it's the Mike Conley turnover, whether it's Bogey missing a wide open three to to win the game on on what to me, not exaggerating at all, what to me was one of the best plays I think Quinn Snyder's drawn up yet. You know, just to get that wide open look. I I, I look at the rest of the game. And I say, yeah, you know, you you did not come out and light it up the way I thought you would have. You know, I I really thought that this team would have benefited a lot from, you know, sleeping in their own bed and being in their own city. And like, you know, I I really thought they would have come out and shot really well from three. And that just didn't happen. That did not translate. So, yeah, I thought last night's game was a a perfect example of the struggles of this team. And and I think it's a for jazz fans. I I mean, I, I understand why. You're you're frustrated, but I'm assuming we'll probably get a lot of comments today that say you're not surprised. And I think that's the best way to say it. Frustrated, disappointed, but not surprised because this Jazz team seemingly in so many ways is a team that is able to compete, is a team that's able to be in most of the games that they play. But a lot of times they just fall short. And and whether we're talking about, you know, the bubble, uh, you know, the Clipper series, this series, like it, it's it seemingly is a never ending list of 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 just not being able to get over the hump with this particular group, and I think finally you know we're we're at the end of the line here, and and I think it's a really interesting situation. Now, what would I do? What would I want to see? Well, I think the first thing I want to see is is the Quinn Snyder thing getting resolved. You know, I I think. You know, the first question that we should pose is, is he going to come back? Would you bring him back? Well, yeah, I'd bring him back. I definitely would. I think last night, that play, when I saw that play unfolding, that was where I was like, all right, yeah, this guy knows what he's doing. You use Donovan as a decoy. You got what probably is your best three-point shooter. Just an absolute doozy of a look. I mean, I can't even remember a play in the NBA where somebody is that wide open. I mean, just nobody around. And so to me, it's like this wasn't a Quinn issue. This was a execution issue. Is it Quinn Snyder's fault that Mike Conley traveled? Is it Quinn Snyder's fault that Donovan Mitchell was passive in one of the most important times of the game? No, it's not. It's not Quinn Snyder's fault. So I that would be where I would start this this offseason. I would I would solidify your head coaching position. I would get on the same page with him as far as what he thinks this team needs or really what Donovan Mitchell needs to be successful. And then I would I would get going. I would get on the phone. I would start calling people. Now, obviously, most of the time in the league, none of those phone calls are really going to get any traction until after the season's really over, like after the NBA Finals are done. But I'd start talking to people. Just see what. Just get some feelers out there. That's that's kind of the direction that I would that I would start with. Yeah, I, I don't know that there's a quick answer for this. Honestly, I, I think a lot of people want to see change, and they want to see change now. And I'm telling you, this is not going to be a fast process. And 
I think if we're getting down to brass tacks, one thing I would point out that I totally agree with you on, why was Donovan Mitchell not in position in the last three possessions to really impact the outcome of those plays? And I think you would have had so much success in the fourth quarter with Donovan Mitchell attacking the paint. Um, the, the Rudy Gobert dunk, the Boyan Bogdanovich corner three. I mean, just repeatedly Donovan Mitchell driving the paint, setting up his teammates, repeatedly pulling down rebounds, sprinting down the floor, only to find out that nobody else was running with him. <laughs> it, it, to me, is very clear that Donovan Mitchell's not the problem on this team. Age and athleticism is the major problem on this team. And I think the easy answer is trade everybody, burn this thing to the ground. I don't believe that they're going to trade everybody. I think there is a foundational trade coming. My my sources tell me that that's going to be Rudy Gobert, that they're going to move Rudy Gobert. And I want to play this piece of audio from Rudy last night uh, after the game because I think this is a really critical, maybe is it a, a, a miss a misspeak? Did he not mean to say what he said? But a lot of people have glossed over the question of, or, or the answer to the question of Rudy Gobert and, you know, his thoughts on, on Quinn Snyder. I mean, I loved, uh, I loved my, my time with Quinn. Uh, Pause right there. Now, hear what he said. And we're going to play the full answer. But you really need to catch what Rudy Gobert says here. He did not say, I love I love my time. I love playing for, for Quinn Snyder. Note that he talked about Quinn Snyder and his time playing with Quinn Snyder in the past tense. I mean, I loved, uh, I loved my, my time with Quinn. Uh, you know, and there's always going to be talk about a lot of things, especially when, um, when you have disappointed endings like we, like we, we had this season. So... You know, once again, there's a lot of things that are out of our control. Uh, what, I can, what I can control is, you know, how, how I can be better, how I can come back better, and, and, and the rest, you know, is whatever the, the, the front office, uh, the, the, you know, the direction, you know, things uh, is out of my control. First I mean, of all, am I making too much of that? First of all, when we're playing these sound bites, I want you to know how like dead these guys sound. They just sound completely defeated and like as you I, would hope. Like I, I under, as you would hope. Yeah, though. like I understand like you know being being upset, being disappointed, being being let down. I mean, I I, I get it. Um, I I don't think you're making too much of this. I mean, I I think players, you know, players say things, and I think that players, you know, a lot of people call Rudy Gobert the best player on the roster. When when Rudy says something like "I loved my time with Quinn," that doesn't send a real strong message that these two are both going to be on this roster or on this staff, you know, come tip off of of camp, you know. And and I think that I don't know, man. I think that Rudy hears the noise. I think that Rudy, you know, understands what's what's going on this this postseason and what he that he's probably going to get moved. I think Rudy gets it. Like I I don't think Rudy's naive. You know, I, does Rudy have opinions on whether he should be moved or whether that's the right thing for the organization? I'm sure he does. But the fact is, is that is that they didn't get the job done again. You know, and, and frankly, he's right at the center of that last night. For all you Rudy Gobert lovers, notice what happened last night. He didn't have a big game, and, and what happened, right? Like, they, he didn't have a big game in the biggest game of the year, and they lose. And it's, and it's just frustrating because this is somebody who yesterday on the show were getting told is <clears throat> the best guy and – Give give Rudy more touches and and like feed this guy. Yet he's not doing anything in the biggest game of the season. That's the frustrating part about it. So yeah, I do think Rudy knows that. Hey, yeah, there's a decent chance I'm going to get moved. Like Rudy gets it. I, I would be shocked if he if that just went over his head. Yeah, I I don't think there's any doubt that Rudy Gobert just talked about Quinn Snyder in the past tense. Uh I, I will also say I want them to sound dejected. Like, if you listen to this Donovan Mitchell um, take here on Quinn Snyder, I want I want guys sounding dejected, and there's no doubt Donovan Mitchell sounds dejected right here. Yeah, yeah you know, I think just given a chance to win, you know, we, we fell short of our goal, and 
It hurts, Sarah, I ain't gonna lie, but yeah. Love Quinn. I love Quinn. Love Quinn. Quinn's, you know, he's a guy that gave me an opportunity when I first got here, um, you know, and, and trusted in me and believed in me, you know. And, you know, I think he's a guy that, you know, there's been so much talked about and he's been, you know, headstrong. He's been steady with it, you know, throughout the year. And that's that's a lot, you know. I think it's it's one of those things, you know, we, we're not – like a, a big market team where we get talked about every day, but you know, this is talk, you know, and I think he's done a phenomenal job of continuing to, to lead us as a group. And I very different answers, very different answers. And I mean, I think, and obviously if you listen to the show every day, you know what I've reported. We, you know, I've been told repeatedly that this team is going to build around Donovan Mitchell and that they are going to do everything they can do to trade Rudy Gobert. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that 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 you know will be interesting today is that I I do believe that Qu there's a good chance Quinn Snyder is going to step away. Man. I think there's a good chance that Quinn Snyder is going to resign uh, as a head coach of the Utah Jazz. Um, I think that it is very clear that there is a burnout factor going on with Quinn. Um, I think there is there is a frustration with Quinn Snyder um, within Quinn Snyder about the the roster construction of this team, um, and you know what? Frankly, I don't think it's too strong to say that that I I think there is significant frustration with Ryan Smith right now because nothing has changed. Yeah, and I think that Ryan Smith has an incredible amount of responsibility to this franchise right here and right now. And there's a reason that Danny Ainge is here. The timing of Danny Ainge coming in was not ideal. December was a bit late, in my opinion. And I understand why. I mean, Danny Danny had family obligations he had to take care of. He was not available to you through the summer and into the fall in training camp. But now, now that he's no longer a consultant, he's the president of basketball operations or the CEO of basketball operations, He's in full control of this team. Yeah, it's time to get it going. Yeah. I mean, it's it's time to change the tide of this organization. And I, and I think that, you know, as far as Quinn is concerned, like I said on the show yesterday, I I, I honest to God can't blame the guy for 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 being frustrated or or for for you know just having some some burnout. Like I, I understand. And and I think, you know, but in our vaunted pre-show meeting behind the scenes, you asked me, hey, well, what would what would, you know, if you were in control, what would your first move be? What would what would you do now that the season's over? And my answer to that, my first move would be bringing Quinn Snyder into an office with Ryan Smith and Danny Ainge and having a a face to face, no no BS kind of conversation and asking him point blank, where are you at right now? How do you feel? And let him just kind of let him get it out, you know. And then at that point, I would then talk to him about what what needs to take place on the basketball floor for Donovan Mitchell to to take the next step and for this organization to take the next step and what Quinn feels like he needs to be successful because that's the only way that you're 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 going to keep him in my opinion that's the only way that that you you rejuvenate a guy in a sense who is frustrated about not having the tools he needs to beat Dallas and i want to make this point too you got to understand he just took Dallas with Luka with 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 all these guys, Dorian Finney-Smith, Reggie Bullock, right? With all all of these guys, Jalen Brunson, all these tools to win basketball games. Quinn doesn't have all those tools. You just took Dallas to game six on your floor to the last possession, basically to the death. And you didn't have really probably, what, three quarters of what Dallas has? Quinn's a good coach. He is a good coach. Yeah, I, I think it is difficult for... I think it is difficult for jazz fans right now um, to separate emotion and and basketball common sense. And I think when you're, you know, when you're pushing the narrative that Quinn Snyder is the issue with this team, I think you just don't understand basketball. You don't understand the the problems with this team. This team got beat because they can't compete athletically. You look at the play where uh, Dorian Finney Smith in the fourth quarter hits a wide open three with Rudy Gobert flailing around. Mm -hmm. um, and Rudy Gobert then, you know, watching Boyan Bogdanovich throw his hands up in frustration and Rudy Gobert pointing at Boyan Bogdanovich. My guess is 
Boyan was supposed to rotate up to Dorian Finney-Smith and Rudy was supposed to go to the corner because Rudy was running to the corner. So either way, that shot was wide open and nobody had a hand up again. And it's repeated. Boyan Bogdanovich's inability to rotate, um, Rudy Gobert's inability or unwillingness to cover the three-point shot, um, that's why this team was so bad defensively on the perimeter. Uh, you, you, you can't possibly believe that Quinn Snyder is a bigger problem than the roster. Like that just, I hope you understand what you have in Quinn Snyder, because if Quinn quits or you fire Quinn Snyder, there's not a, a an obvious replacement. You can't bring in a guy who has no head coaching experience and expect to win uh, with this team. That's not going to happen. I mean, you you have to have somebody that these players listen to and respect. And you have to have somebody that if you fire Quinn Snyder, I don't know what you're hoping to upgrade to. Like, what what do you think you're going to get that's better? I mean, the, 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 the names that you constantly hear are, are guys like, you know, Sam Cassell was talked about last night. Mm-hmm. Sam Cassell's not an upgrade over Quinn <clears throat> Snyder. Sam Cassell has zero head coaching experience. Zero, none, not even a little. He's an assistant coach. What does he bring that Quinn Snyder does not? That's the question. If you hire a guy with zero experience, you're going to have growing pains. You can't afford that. This is a team that needs to win now. This is a team that's very limited. And the the question that I have is, if you're in the the fire Quinn Snyder camp, what would you have done differently? Sure, would you have played the young guys? Yeah, maybe. That's the one criticism that you can that you can justifiably level against Quinn Snyder is that he did not play the young guys. He is not he is not somebody that's going to to play you know a guy like a, a an Azabuki even though I, I felt like Azubuki was getting minutes before he got hurt again. Yeah. Um, I look at Jared Butler, who seems to be one of the most controversial jazz players on the roster right now. I don't know. It, it, it's chicken or the egg. Like, Jared Butler was not really productive in the time he got. So he likely did not earn more minutes. So other than being, what, the 41st pick in the draft, did, does that earn you more minutes? I don't know. They sent him down in the G League. I wish they'd have left him there for a month. I wish they would have let him play, you know, four weeks of starters minutes in the G League and then bring him up when he's fully, you know, fully ramped. I don't I don't know. But Jared Butler doesn't fix what's wrong with this team. He doesn't. I I thought Quinn Snyder made several very good adjustments in this series. I mean, until they absolutely lost their minds last night and stopped running offense, this team in the in the second quarter. That is the best that I have seen this team play all season long. And that second quarter was very clearly their best quarter of the series, yeah. especially offensively. And why was that? Because Rudy Gobert was not in the paint. Rudy Gobert was in the corner. He was at the the, the block extended um, so that he was out of the paint. It opened up room for guys like Jordan Clarkson and Donovan Mitchell. And they were getting to the rim. They were making their layups. And then they just stopped doing that in the third quarter. And I don't understand it. I I don't understand it. And in the fourth quarter, you stopped attacking the basket in the last five minutes of the game. And I don't understand that. And is that on Quinn Snyder? No, it's not. It's on the players. When you lose the way this team lost, it's not a Quinn Snyder problem. He's making adjustments. Look at the rotations they used. Being bringing Jordan Clarkson in for Mike Conley is exactly the right thing to do. And then bringing in Mike Conley and playing Don Conley and and, uh, JC together, I thought was a really smart move. I thought taking Rudy Gobert off the floor and bringing in Eric Paschal, who immediately benefited you with three more possessions, was a really good move. I wish he'd have left him out there longer. He didn't. I wish he would have. But he didn't. And, you know, everybody's saying, well, you got to protect the rim, and Rudy's your best defender at the rim. Ask Jalen Brunson about Rudy Gobert, the defender in the paint. Man. You know, ask the the problem is, as Quinn so eloquently pointed out, you have that Quinn Snyder bite. 
where he talked about them playing five out. I guess we don't, but they they can and this is a buzzword I think people love to throw around. Oh, they were playing five out. What that means is they didn't have anybody in the paint. The the Dallas Mavericks spread the Utah Jazz out. And Rudy Gobert is exposed in that in that set. But what do you want Quinn Snyder to do? I would have liked to have seen Eric Pasco play a little more. Yeah. But he didn't. I thought Quinn's adjustments worked very well in 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 especially last night. I thought they were on display. It's not Quinn Snyder's fault that this team can't knock down a three. Yeah. It is not Quinn Snyder's fault that that like on TNT they had him in the huddle imploring his guys to run harder. And they couldn't. They were out of gas. It's not his fault that Mike Conley's 71 years old. It's not his fault. By the way, I don't know how much more, again, not to be redundant, what better play could you have drawn up on that final shot? Yeah. What more do you want Quinn Snyder to do there? I thought it was a masterful play design. I wish Donovan Mitchell would have been the one taking that shot. I do. But it was a masterful play design. Um, it got your arguably your best three-point shooter a wide open look. I don't know what more you could have asked for there. I don't think you can. There's not there isn't much more to ask for. And I and I think that it, it to me it's just so clear. You're you're you, when you play good teams, when you play seven game playoff series and you know you're you're playing a team that's equal to you essentially. Your weaknesses are going to get exposed. They're going to find them and they're going to exploit them. And it always feels ugly. And this is this is what we've seen. You know, we last year the weakness was well, Rudy can't guard the paint and guard the corner. That was that was the the conversation piece. That was the narrative. This year's team can't make a three. You, you just can't make a shot when you need to make a shot. You can't, like, even throughout the game, just in open, you know, open play, not even set pieces, just wide open, free-flowing game. You're get, Donovan is creating looks for these guys, and they just can't make a shot. Now, I'm sure that we're going to have people say, well, Donovan didn't have a great game. You're right. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't have 40 last night. You're right. But was he putting a lot of guys in positions to be successful and they were just missing? Yeah, he was. So that's why I say, like, I think Rudy is sort of the spearhead to to your offseason. You know, what you do with that will largely determine what you're able to do with all these other guys. Yeah. However, I think once that happens, the conversation then needs to shift to, all right, well, number one, what does this team defensively look like now that Rudy Gobert is off the roster? Right. And who went with him, by the way, because you're not just trading him alone in a trade. You're going to have to send other people, I would guess. And then number two, who's the head coach of the team? Those are the two things that you, that I'd be looking for most immediately as far as major changes on this team. To your point, does Quinn Snyder resign today? Does do we see that like immediately or does he decide to stay? I don't think it'll be a today thing. I think um, that you have a situation where it's going to take time. Um, I don't think it is a today thing. I yeah. think that you're going to take a couple of days and you're going to, you're going to talk about some things. And I think that they're going to do their player, their player exit interviews. Um, and I think that's after you do your player exit interviews, you talk to your coach and, and his staff. I think the one hole in the, in the coaching staff here is, um, you know, a, 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 a real solid player development guy. You need a master player development guy you've got to get more from like again Jerry Butler comes to mind like he's the one guy that you have in youth that you know we talked about Trent Forrest this week and I just don't see a whole lot of upside on Trent Forrest unless he is able to create um an ability or or grow the ability to shoot the ball I I just I don't think he's a, a he's a, a top 10 player on a roster I really don't I don't know that Jared Butler's a top 10 player on a roster. I think he has the ability. I don't know that he ever develops that in, in Utah. And that could be uniquely a Utah thing. Um, but I think, you know, you have got to bring in an assistant coach that is a stud developing players, whether that is, you know, and the problem is the two best guys, Kenny Atkinson or like a Darvin Ham, um, who, who is a really good developer of talent, those guys are going to be head coaches. So my guess is that they're not going to be available to you, but you have got to find somebody that can come in here and develop players. Because even before he got popped for being a, a, a fucking fraudster, uh, Keon Dooling was not exactly lighting the world on fire developing talent. 
I mean, th- and this that's guy. who that's who the young guys are working with on this roster. Like, I just i i don't I don't see that. Yeah. Right. So I think you have a hole on your coaching staff now. You're going to need to upgrade that spot. Um. So we'll see how that goes. But my guess is, I mean, if I were a betting man right now, I I would. You know, if the plan is to make significant changes to this roster, I think Quinn Snyder stays. But I I think I can say confidently 95% the Jazz want Quinn Snyder to be their head coach. They're going to – I agree with you. They're going to need to have some real conversations with him. Yeah. And they're going to have to, uh, you know, kind of decide where they're going. I know that they know where they're going. They've known where they're going since December. Danny came in with a real good idea. One of the things that not being in charge of the basketball ops allowed Danny Ainge to do was just watch some basketball, was watch the Utah Jazz, evaluate the Utah Jazz, understand who this team is. And while Justin Zanuck was the guy making the calls, Danny Ainge had a pretty big influence on what was happening at the deadline. And I think that's why Danny waited. That's why there wasn't a huge move at the deadline. Um, Because they had opportunities. They had opportunities, and that's why I think there was some frustration, um, you know, with Quinn Snyder and other people in this organization that they essentially got nothing for 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 um, Joe Ingles' expiring contract. Yeah, and I think the other thing that you have to really evaluate is is how how important are the guys that are on your roster now? Like, I mean, they, they, I'm having a raging debate on Twitter about the value of Mike Conley for twenty two point six million dollars. Yeah, I mean that that value doesn't look real good after last night. Not I mean, right now. Uh, I, I, well, I mean after the last six weeks. And and I think the thing with Conley and the, that whole situation is, it, you know, you did a good job managing health with Conley. You know, he didn't suffer that 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 injury that kept him out. But, but this is what I, I I've said about Mike Conley. The yeah. problem for Mike Conley is he's not hurt. He's not hurt. He's playing. And this is one of the first times that we can say since Mike Conley joined the team, injuries are not an issue. You know what the issue is? Father time. Yeah. He is still undefeated. Yeah. Father time is undefeated. And Mike Conley is losing the battle with father time. The, the, that's something that not a lot of people have talked about. And I've been, I, I've, I've been somebody who has said, hey, water's wet and Mike Conley's injured in the playoffs. Well, guess what? He's not injured in the playoffs. But he is turning the ball over at a critical moment. He is missing layups. He is just now at 29%, I think the number is, um, in the paint. He's shooting 29% in the paint. How? I, which is unbelievable. He's still a really good three-point shooter. But Mike Conley's not luxury tax Mike Conley. He's not that He's not that guy. Yeah. And paying $22.6 million next year with a third-year option, by the way, as well, that's a lot of scratch for a dude that – is on the wrong side of 70. You're not that guy, pal. Trust yeah. me. You're not that guy. You're on the wrong side of 70, Mike Conley. Yeah. Like you're an old dude now. And frankly, this team doesn't need an old head. They need a they need a young guy. Yeah. You know, so I I, I just I think Mike Conley's a really interesting guy. I also think that you're you're past your highest best value of Boyan Bogdanovich. I think you've held on to Boyan too long. Yeah, and I think that he's an uncomfortable conversation for a lot of jazz fans, I would guess. You know, he's somebody who who, you know, not just with the last play last night, but like just generally speaking, you know, a lot of Jazz fans, I feel like, have come around to the idea that he is a liability defensively uh, in certain situations. I think, I like, as an example, they had him playing full court press for most of this series on Jalen Brunson. Like, you, he was picking him up on their end of the floor a yeah. lot. Yes. And I think that that's an unrealistic expectation. And that's what I'll continue to say. This Jazz roster... Ask guys to do things that they are not capable of doing. You want Rudy Gobert to not turn the ball over when he puts it on the floor. You want, uh, you know, Mike Conley to 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 be more durable because you don't have anybody behind him. That was risking it of itself. You want, you know, whoever you want to point to. Like you can't keep asking guys to do more than they're capable of. That's not going to work. Yeah, and that's it. That's been a significant issue on this team. Is I think that you're putting guys. Rudy Gobert is a really good example of this. You're. You're putting Rudy Gobert, and you're asking him to do things he's not capable of. But you can't take Rudy Go- – I mean, the guy's making $41 million a year. Yeah. He's making a quarter of your salary cap, man. And and I believe it's more than a quarter of your salary cap. Like, you just can't – you cannot do that. And 
I think it's really difficult when you are asking guys like Rudy Gobert um, to make to make these kinds of of plays when that's just not who they are as a player. And so when you ask when you ask guys like Mike Conley to to carry your team in the fourth quarter in a big moment, you're making a huge mistake. Yeah, you know, and and I think that the other thing that's of issue is that you're in a in a tough spot when it comes to the moves that that Quinn Snyder could have made. And again, I just continue to point this out. I think he was very limited as far as options go. So when you look at the way they're defending, I, can you ask Rudy Gobert to step up to the three-point line and expect that to end well? I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I don't think you can because you don't have athletes to rotate. Have we not seen enough of that? Have we not seen, like, you know, I, I guess my question on that would be, have you not seen it enough times where you've got, like, hell, not even the three-point line, like, to the point you made, like, even in the even in the free throw free throw line area, like, you've got guys like Luka and Jalen Brunson just eating, you know, and, and that's why I say, like, we would be having, frankly, we'd be having a different conversation if Rudy was getting paid 20 a year. We'd be having a different conversation. The money is what what brings the expectations, and that's and, and the other thing is that I don't want people to forget this. Like forty one million dollars a year is the average annual value of this deal. Yeah, you need to remember that he's getting paid. I think it's thirty five this year, and it goes up every year as he gets yeah, deeper 30, into the it's deal. Thirty eight. He's he's owed one hundred and sixty nine point six million dollars. So I it's mean, only going to get worse, and that's why I say like, oof. if you remember for for our long time. Daily listeners, the people who've been listening to this show since since the Gobert extension was signed last year, you remember on that day when that news came out, we said that he's not a championship player. Is he a damn good rim protector? Yes, he is. He's not a championship contender, though, or a championship player. And the day that they decide to move his contract off this roster, there will be a heavy price to pay for that. And they're going to pay that price. And, yeah. and that's just the unfortunate part. You, you escalate Rudy Gobert's contract. It was 35.3 this year, 38.1 next year, 41 flat in 23, 24, 43.8 in 24, 25, 46.6 on an option year in I'm, 25, I, 26. I mean, you start looking at that deal and the Man. way that pans out. I know that everyone is all about Donovan to the Knicks, and that's like the convenient story. The thing that scares me about that deal, if they were not to move Rudy Gobert, which I think they will, but if they were to keep him, that does not bode well for Donovan Mitchell's future with this organization no, because that not. limits what you can do. And so that's why I say, like, get it out of here now. Go. Get it done. Like, just be out of it. Yeah, it's it's the money. I'm looking at some of these deals. I mean, I think you got to trade Boyan Bogdanovich. I mean, he's coming up on his free agent year. Um, the, he's he's under contract for one more season, 22-23, uh, $19.3 million or whatever it is. And then yeah. he's, he's an unrestricted free agent. And he's got value. He's a guy I think you move. And, I, and I, I mean, I just – some of these numbers. I mean, I, I, the Mike Conley deal is the one that's going to – it, that haunts you. It absolutely haunts you. Um, but Rudy Gobert, Conley, um, you know, Jordan Clarkson at $13.3 million. <laughs> but the thing here is Don's deal. Like, literally Don's deal. Everyone wants to say, oh, well, he's got to be better because he's on a uh, – not a super – is it? I don't think it's no, a super – No, he got a rookie extension. He got a rookie extension. He got a rookie extension. Hey, he's on this rookie extension, and he's getting paid. He's not getting paid in parlance of what everyone else is getting paid. I no. can tell you that. No, not at all. I mean, it's, I think his average number is thirty-two point six. I mean, like he's got he's got three years and an option year left after this, and you're only paying him thirty million dollars. Thirty-two, thirty point three next year, thirty-two point six, and thirty-four point eight, and his option year is thirty-seven million dollars. I mean, for your leading scorer, your number one guy, your star player, that's that's good money. That's a very good contract. And it's the extension to his rookie deal. I mean, it, it was a no-brainer um, at the time you did it. It's a no-brainer now. You know, like, I mean, yeah. I, I just – there there's not an easy answer here. And, you know, like the, the thing that's amazing to me is that, you know, everybody, everybody wants more from Donovan. But if you want more from Donovan, you have to give him more around him. You know, like that's the, that's the, the, mm -hmm. the crux of the argument. 
Um, let's get your comments in here this morning uh, as we talk about the Jazz losing to the uh, the Dallas Mavericks last night. Um, they are eliminated from the playoffs. And, and again, I would remind you, an era of Jazz basketball came to an end last night. Yeah. When Boyan missed that three, an era of, of, of basketball came to an end. Uh, good morning, and Garcy. Um, <laughs> Savage says, are, were you, so you guys turned out to be correct about Daniel House. He is a zero. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say he's a zero. See, don't get carried away. Don't swing to Donovan sucks, Rudy's terrible. Like, you're in the NBA, you don't suck. You're in the NBA, you're not a zero. Daniel House is a victim of expect expectations. Daniel House came in here and people expected him to, I don't know, do what? He's a journeyman. Jesus, if that's not the theme of this team. They're a victim of their expectations. Of of just over over inflating of expectations. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really the issue. And I think what you what you see is that, you know, like Hernan Gomez is another guy that that is like a fan favorite and he's amazing. And I thought, listen, I thought he actually outplayed the expectation, I mean, when they brought him on. I think on, he did. Like, he, this is a guy that they said, you know, that the, the local media talking head said that was going to be just a a guy that was going to sit on the end of your bench through the rest of the season and not give you anything. And this is somebody who's who, frankly, was getting, for a guy like him, some pretty major run. I mean, I'm not saying he's playing 30 minutes a night, but he was getting some really, you know, long exposure and making some threes and doing some things. So... I thought he outplayed his expectations. Man, Donovan Mitchell, that play to Boyan Bogdanovich where he drove and kicked in the corner, the highlights are on in the background here. That play was unbelievable, but it is just so disheartening. The Jalen Brunson three-pointer out of the corner where Boyan just didn't get there. Um, you know, like the, 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 uh, the defense last night on the perimeter was just, it's so bad. And... This play where where Donovan gives the ball to Mike Conley, Mike Conley should have pulled up for a three. I or mean, he just was go just, and get fouled. He was like, wide open. Well, and after the game, Boy, both Boyan man. and Mike Conley said, and this is another issue with the Jazz, dude. Boyan and Mike Conley last night both said that they they changed their decision making because they weren't getting calls. Boyan Bogdanovich straight up said he didn't go to the basket for two uh, at the end of the game there because he hadn't gotten a call all series long. Well, that's, I mean, that's and I'm just like, are, are you dude. kidding me? I, I mean, look, I don't have a problem with them shooting that three. Frankly, I, if you can get that kind of look with Boyan Bogdanovich, take it every time, take it every time. I just, I, I think the logic, you know, the, the tough part is, is like, you know, you're, you're down two in that situation. And so it's, it's tough because the play was so good. The execution was perfect. I mean, you have, listen, you've got, I think it was Dorian Finney Smith running into Spencer Dinwiddie, who then ran his ass off to get to Boyan over there on the wing. It was executed perfectly. Perfectly. Like you couldn't have asked for the sidestep, the ball fake, like the whole thing. Yeah. And, and I just, I think that this is the issue that I have is, is that, now Donovan's got a lot to prove because, you know, my my opinion is, and I tweeted it as it was happening, this should be Donovan's moment. Yeah. And the ball did not go to Donovan Mitchell. And whether that's a lack of confidence in him, I doubt that. Um, I think they they wanted an open look, and they, they got an open look. And Don was clearly bracketed. There's no doubt yeah. if you go back and watch that play, they had they had two guys dedicated to him, which is why Boyan got open. Mm -hmm. um, and Clarkson set a really nice back screen. Um, I, the play went exactly as you would have wanted it to. I just, I, that's what I'm saying. It's not a Quinn thing. It's and, an execution thing. And by the way, this team all season long has lived and died on the three. Mm. And mm. that's who you are, man. That's his spot. By the way, I would remind you, where is Boyan Bogdanovich most comfortable shooting from that exact spot that he was standing when he took that three. He it's usually Royce in the corner and you usually have Boyan right there at the elbow. Like that, there's nothing else that you want. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what you want. And in you my could opinion. see real quick before you read those. You could see during the play, and if you go on YouTube, you watch the highlights, or you know wherever you see the highlight, just watch the Mavericks bench. The Mavericks bench thought that oh, was going in, dude. Yeah, the Mavericks thought they were in trouble. There. Yeah, they thought they were going to play Game Seven. Yes. there's no doubt. Uh, Erich Devera, good morning to you. Uh, morning, boys, though it's evening here in the Philippines. Good to see you. Uh, Edgar Garcia says, morning, guys. Uh, no Mamba. That's why he passed it. Get the fuck out! Well, 
Not in the mood for so it wait, today, dude. So wait, then, Garcia, you're trying to say that he needs to be Kobe Bryant? Is that what that's a, uh, a reference what is the, to? Like, what is the reference to? What, 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 what I, I Donovan would like Mitchell, to... Donovan Mitchell was by far your best player. He dominated last night at times. I would like you to come into the comments section and explain how, how Don is supposed to, to do better. Okay, you want to say he should have made more shots? Completely agree. Didn't live up to it in the shot making department. Hundred percent with you on that. You want to say that his no? no I think is this? He's the same guy that and says Garcia, Donovan yeah. no D Mitchell. Yeah, right. Like Donovan Mitchell's defense has been better. He's yeah, he played made better, two dude. big defensive plays like, last night, and and that's why I say like I I don't disagree. He's got some shortcomings. He needs development. In my opinion, we disagree on this just a touch. I don't think that Donovan Mitchell is in Jason Tatum. Devin Booker land. No, right not now. not anymore. He's not because like, because I think Book and Tate. Devin Booker last night is is in the midst of one of his worst games in the playoffs because he's coming back from an injury. You can see his legs are not he's underneath. Shooting him. air balls last night, bro. <laughs> like, Only he didn't shoot an air ball. He made one of the biggest threes yeah. in that game. Yeah, they gave him the ball and he knocked down a three. Yeah, Donovan Mitchell is below that cut now. This last six weeks has been incredibly detrimental to him. And it's it is a matter of too many turnovers, and he's got to have a mid range game, and he's going. I guarantee you, he knows that he has got to. If I am Ryan Smith, and if I am Danny Ainge, and if I am Quinn Snyder, I am telling Donovan Mitchell, you need to improve your stamina, you need to improve the the health in your legs, mm -hmm. and you have got to be an absolute lethal motherfucking assassin in the mid range. Yes. Did you watch the Suns last night, dude? If you didn't see that Chris Paul had a historic performance. That motherfucker don't miss, 14 man. of 14 from the floor, and almost all of it was in the mid-range. He dominated the, the New Orleans Pelicans in the mid-range. And you look at DeAndre Ayton dominating with the, the mid-range jumper. You look at, at, at the way that they won that game, it was defending the mid-range and, and scoring the mid-range. And that's why the Suns are, are, are seeing an absolute twilight performance out of an older guy. He's an assassin. And you're not getting that from Mike Conley. Mm -mm. Because Mike's not a mid-range player. Yeah, see, and I was going to say that earlier when we were talking about Mike, the CP3 Mike conversation and comparison. Oh, it's one that it, happens like, all the time. Like, and, and it needs to continue to happen. And, and look, I get it. Chris Paul is, is a better player. Like, he has been. He's done more. He is arguably, like, and, and Chris Paul is an interesting discussion. He's arguably the best point guard in the history of the NBA. Yeah. If he wins a championship, he there's no doubt in my mind he'll be the, he'll be known as the best point guard in the history of the NBA. Yeah. Because he's, got, do you understand what he's doing? Like, that to me is what's missing from Don's game. Yeah. The lethal ability. There were three, four, five opportunities for him to just pull up. Hit the brakes, pull up, drop a mid-range jumper. Well, and I think so often we, um, on the show, we talk about how we want Don to control the game, control the flow of the game, the pace of the game, yes. control how the game is is moving. And and you see, you see last night with Chris Paul, he's able to do that, whether it's getting to the foul line, whether it's, it's th there were so many times last night, and, and, can, and watch Chris Paul as they, as they move through the playoffs. There are so many times in the middle of a free-flowing game where he brings the ball up, and he'll just stand there and burn like five, six seconds off the shot clock, just waiting. And then they go. And it, and that's what but I want to learn. why can he do that? Because he's got the mid-range. He knows what he's going to do. He knows the exact spot he needs to get to. And he knows how to leverage that. Yeah. And, and that's what Donovan Mitchell doesn't have. Don last night, again, I thought was really good. Damn near he had a triple-double in, in rebounds and dimes. Mm -hmm. And the passing to Rudy Gobert... You can drop that narrative. I see three, four comments that he won't give the ball to Rudy Gobert. Did you watch the game last night? Did you watch the series? I mean, they, he was giving the ball to Rudy. He created two opportunities in the fourth quarter for Rudy. He created two opportunities for Boyan. Like, Don's a lot of things. A problem for the Jazz is not one of them. Yeah. And they're not going to trade him. It's not going to happen. Uh, JP Shanahan, good morning to you. Greg Hawkins, good morning to you. JP says, whoa, comment dump. Sorry about that. Um, I will move on. Jeremy Bolton says, morning. Uh, Asler 2K says, Eugene 12, Jazz should draft him at 30. They don't, they, don't have a, they don't have a draft pick in the first round. 
So it'll be interesting to see what they do. I don't know what the answer to that is. Giggity says Boyan was basically by himself in the gym shooting that last three. Yes. He just choked trying to blame the refs. I agree. He missed that shot, no doubt. Spencer Morgan, what's up? He says, uh, I think when we look back on this team, we can point to the beginning of the end as being the game where all the players and the coach went off uh, went after the officiating, officially adopting the victim mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and they've been that team. Yeah, they've been, and that's and that's a criticism you can throw. Go at back Glenn. to last year, that road trip last year that ended in Philly. I want to say it was right before the All Star break mm-hmm. when Don got ejected. Yeah, that's when the problems with the officials started. And Boyan, Boyan, the last month of the season was the biggest defender of that. I think the whole locker room drama, Rudy Gobert thing, mm-hmm. actually worked. I mean, when they, they, the leadership on this team, Don and Jordan Clarkson and, um, you know, Mike Conley went to, went to Rudy and said, you got to stop chirping the officials constantly last night when he did it, like the, the, the block uh, down low where Luca blocked Rudy's shot. It was a foul. No doubt. It was a foul, but you can't stand there and yell at the officials and keep slapping your arm because they went down and scored. But furthermore. Furthermore, why shouldn't he have been in that position? And they said this on the broadcast. He shouldn't have been in that position because he should have just gone up and done. Yeah, why he was trying to gl- go off glass there? You got to go up and power that ball down on yeah. Luca. Yeah, you, you, and he it should, should be an and one. But, but that's not who Rudy Gobert is. Correct. That's not he's soft. Rudy Gobert, and for all of the things that we've talked about, I've tried to drive this point home. One of the biggest flaws in Rudy Gobert's game is he is soft. You can have Rudy Gobert. You can dunk on Rudy Gobert if you're Terrence Mann. There's no hard foul. Like you, if you look at the best centers of of the last 10 years, Mm -hmm. nine out of 10 of those guys are not going to let you dunk on them. Like who are like Dwight Howard in his prime? You were not dunking on Dwight Howard. Mm -hmm. Um, You were not dunking on Shaquille O'Neal, right? Like as we phased out the big man, as we phased out the center in the NBA, guys like Rudy Gobert have become, uh, you know, on the regular softer. And most of those guys, who's the great big American center in the NBA right now? Well, it's not a thing. There's not. They're all Euros. They're all. All from from international countries. Yeah. You look at guys like Joe. You look at guys like Rudy. Rudy, you know, obviously he's French. It's not a secret. He's soft as hell. Yeah, Rudy Gobert is soft. That's that's the issue. Um, no mama mentality. Take over the damn game. He did take over the game, but that last play was very clearly. And Garcia says that that's what that no mama mentality means. That last play was drawn to use Don as a distraction, okay. and it worked. Here's the tough thing about it. So look around the league. Look at look at the guys who are able to take over games. What do they have? They have the mid-range. What do they have? They have guys around him who the defense has to respect. The Jazz don't have that. You don't have to respect Boyan Bogdanovich off the dribble. You don't have to respect it. You don't. You know, yeah, you don't, you have, don't to have to respect Mike Conley. You don't have to respect Mike Conley. You don't have like and, and that's my that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm telling you, like, I understand that this morning after this game. And after the way things went down and everything, you know, we can sit here and say that this is on Don. And as the best player on the team, sure, there's some of that. Yes. But but you can't sit here and say that that Donovan Mitchell just is not getting the job done and he's the reason they got eliminated because that's that's just garbage. Dude, look dude. at New Orleans last night. Like, the Suns highlights are now on NBA TV. Yeah. Alvarado, you're looking at Brandon Ingram. Like, you're looking at – I mean, you're looking at Herb Jones. You're yeah. looking at – I mean – Valanchunas, Larry Nance Jr., like, like they've got team, all guys that are c- contributing. They're a team that's just not better than the Suns. That's they, right. They lost because they were playing a team that was just simply better. Well, the Pelicans played their best basketball. Yes. There's no there's no doubt about that. The Suns are just the best team in the NBA. Yeah. And so my point is you don't have a group of guys playing together as a team in Utah. Correct. Because they don't have the talent to do what's needed to be done. Donovan Mitchell needs better players around him. There is, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, this team was an average uh, playoff team when healthy. We need young point guard and a center that can play on the offensive end. Eugene Twelve says, Michael Burton. Good morning to you. I'm not sad. It was a competitive game. Mavs are a good team. The issue is other young teams will improve, and the Jazz will need to do the same. The Jazz need to get younger and more athletic. Yeah. That is the number one need when we talk about roster construction. 
the, the Utah Jazz have got to get younger and more athletic. And they've got to get longer, more able wing play on this team. That, there's no doubt about that. And there's only one way to do that. Salary cap space. And right now, how are you going to do that? You're going to trade Rudy, and you're going to trade Boyan. Yeah, you got to go through some pain here. Just you know? is what it is. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I think Mike Conley's contract is more difficult to trade than Rudy Gobert's. I, 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 honestly, at his age, you owe him 40 million. dollars. I don't know how somebody takes that on. I don't know how somebody it takes was, that on. It was. The, the, before they signed that extension with him, the rumor mill was that Dallas really was Dallas high on and him. the Lakers wanted, were the two places he'd have likely ended up. But Dallas ain't an option anymore because there's somebody named Jalen Brunson who's filled that role. Yeah, they, and look at the way Dallas plays. They play with three point guards, Spencer Dinwiddie, Jalen Brunson, and, and Luka Doncic. And then you've got Bullock and Finney Smith that can knock it down at any and time. And Tim dude. Hardaway Jr. is injured and not even playing. That's crazy to think about. Too. I mean, they they that team is going to be good for a long time. Yeah. So I, I that's what the Jazz are missing. Giggity says Jazz fans think every game Don should play like CP3 last night. They that's the expectation. Yeah, I think you're right. The expectation of Jazz fans and Donovan Mitchell is it's crazy. I don't I don't understand the side with Rudy Gobert thing. I've never been that guy. I've never been that guy. So I don't. I'm not. This is not a seven-footer league. There are very few seven-footers. Joel Embiid last night showed you why he's it. Um, Kevin Durant's shown you repeatedly why he's it. Mm. But there are very few seven-footers who are that guy. And Rudy Gobert ain't that guy. So yeah. uh, Michael Burton says, Pell's going places um, took perfect performance from CP3 for them to walk away from there with a win. I agree. Yeah. So the plan is to trade Coach Q to the Lakers and get a pick. Uh, Asler 2K says, I think the Lakers didn't even have a pick. I don't know who's saying to trade him to the Lakers for a pick. I, I where like yeah, where? I I don't know. I certainly don't think that's an option. Um, you know, like I just think I don't I don't know. I I just think that I think Quinn Snyder is going to take a year off. I do. I think that Quinn. My guess is he resigns. I've I, I like that'd be my guess. Yeah. Unless they go to him and well, the problem is, is he's going to be in high demand as soon as he's a free agent or available. If you, if, yeah. If, well, you know I, mean, I mean, if he resigns, he's going to have to, re- you know, wait out his contract. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it is what it is. I'm excited to see all these changes. They need to happen. The ball is in the front office now and they need to make changes. ASAP says, uh, talking with Raphael podcast. I agree. I agree. Uh, a couple more. David Morris says people now calling for Don to do hero ball while blaming him for playing hero ball in pe- past losses. Yeah. I mean, I, it is, but that's the life of a superstar. You are in a no-win situation. No matter what, you're going to be, you're going to, you're going to take the blame. It's rings or bust. I mean, that's yeah. just what it is. That's the expectation. Uh, Asler 2K says they did trade down to get Butler. Herb Jones is a second rounder. They should get him at 30. I, the draft, the, the draft is. You're not, this is not yeah. a team that's going to draft a, a contributor. I mean, it, you you just don't – that's not how – A, that's not how Danny Ainge has historically built a team. And B, that's not, in my opinion, how a – I this team is not going to completely rebuild. They're not doing that. I, 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 again, will say I think they are going to trade Rudy Gobert and Boyan Bogdanovich. And I think they will largely – keep most of the guys they have in place after that. that I mean, but that will have a huge impact on the way they're able to play the game. Not just how yeah. they play, but but what they're able to do after that. And I think they would love to move on from Mike Conley's contract. I just don't know that that's going to be possible. Yeah. I mean, Mike Conley, if he gets traded, my guess is he'd be a buyout candidate. I, I Because I, I just don't see that there's a whole lot of teams around the league that have a, need an aging point guard that's got $40 million plus guaranteed to him. Yeah, like that's an awfully tough. Sell. I mean, that's I mean, that admittedly, that does sound very Lakerish to me. You but know, like, but the but again, can yeah. he contribute? No. Can I, Mike Mike Conley is a, a 15, 20 minute guy that that if we're really being honest, is a three point specialist at this point in his career because he can still make the three point shot. Does Mike Conley want to be that guy? I don't know that he wants to be. That I feel guy. like sometimes he he is really good at breaking the paint, but not obviously not against every team. But there are times where he's able to get there and just can't finish. Like you, you gotta you gotta finish. Like you, what would we be talking about if he if he had hit all those floaters or hit all those runners or like even hit half of them? You know, like what what would the conversation be? And that's my point. Like yeah. where would this? You you lost, dude. You lost by two points last night. 
Maybe if you had shot a free throw or two better. Maybe if you had made one more three. Mike Conley makes two more floaters. Like, this team, the frustrating thing is, this team is so close, but, man, are they so far. You know, they're right in this game last night, but just can't get it done. Can't get it done. Oh, come on. And Garcia says, who did Allen Iverson have? Stop, dude. Guy, are you are you serious? You you're you're seriously comparing <laughs> this this generation of basketball to Allen Iverson? Oh my god! Come on, bro. Uh, I it, see. To me, I look at. I mean, having watched that that having watched those teams where the, even in his MVP year, dude, Allen Iverson had prime Andre Iguodala. Do we do we forget that? Like, do you just not remember? What are we t- like? And by the way, he's also a guy that was hurt constantly. Like hurt constantly. I, I I just don't know. You know, when I look at his playoff numbers, Allen I the the other thing is Allen Iverson is a was a volume shooter. Like the guy just I I don't know. I mean it's not I it's look fun. at the fi- I look at the finals the year they went to the finals in two thousand and one. Um I mean they they they, they that's that's awfully difficult. I mean, they had a Hall of Fame coach. Larry Brown, I think, was the coach of that team. Um, and if you look at the guys that really contributed to that team, like Dikembe Mutombo, um, Theo Ratliff, everybody, you forget about Theo Ratliff. You forget about, I mean, who are we? Like this, that was a that was a really that was a good team. Like that, but Allen Iverson, if I remember right, Allen Iverson, and I can look it up, but I want to say Allen Iverson in that year was like a 30-point-a-guy night, and he was their scorer. Um, yeah, he was. He averaged 30 points. Theo Ratliff averaged 12. Um, Deke averaged 11. Aaron McKee averaged 11. Like, I mean, they won with that, that team, that particular team. Um, for, for Iverson, I mean, they were just a really – they came out of a pretty weak Eastern Conference. He was a superior player. Um you know, like, I mean, if you look at that, that, that Lakers team, I mean, the Lakers team um, that, that won that championship, I mean, Kobe Fisher, um, you know, that's right, Horace Grant was on that team, like mm-hmm. Shaquille O'Neal, obviously, but I mean, you look at the guys on that team, I mean, Robert Ory was one of the most cl- clutch players in the history of the NBA, uh, you know, like Kobe, Derek Fisher, Rick Fox was on yeah. that. Like, I mean, that's a the, come on. Who are we kidding? Like, it's Allen not a Iverson. Good comparison. Allen Iverson's a really good player. I, I don't. I'm not trying to take anything away from him, but not to mention that was a completely different era of basketball. What year was that? 2000, I want to say, or 2001. Two, 2000. Like you're talking about AI in his prime was 24 years ago, 23 years ago. I mean, that's a completely different time in the NBA. What are you talking about, Allen yeah. Iverson? It's just not. I, yeah. Stay in the present. The expectations for Donovan Mitchell, you know, ripping the guy saying he doesn't play defense or he's no Mamba mentality. Like, how many guys have Mamba mentality? Like, do you even know what that means? Like, I, I mean, do you understand that there, there's not another Kobe now and there's never going to be? There, there just isn't. There, there, it, you look at the best guys now, like the best player in the NBA is probably Kevin Durant. I mean, it, it, it dollars to donuts right now. I would probably put it on Kevin Durant. And how many guy? How many other Kevin Durants are in this league? Yeah, that can do what he. You want to talk about a lethal mid range player? I mean, Donovan Mitchell's not even in his in his zip code. Yeah, I mean, he Donovan Mitchell. And it's not a fair comparison. Come on, if if, if <laughs> they, they, Allen Iverson like, and Garcia, I love you, dude. Like I enjoy our conversations, but Allen Iverson's a ridiculous example. Yeah. That is a an absolutely ridiculous example. You know, I, I think when you look at guys that like and I'm a book guy, like look, Ty Johnson's like Booker's got the mama mentality. I I love Devin Booker. He's not a killer. Or at least yet he has not been. Right? Like he also says that that um Giannis is better than than Durant. Giannis is not better than Kevin Durant. Mm-mm. I, I don't know anybody that's taken Giannis Bro, over Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant <laughs> took the Nets on his own to was that was that I think that was game six last year or seven I can't remember. You're talking about not winning that series off of 
two inches because his foot is just too damn big. Giannis is not better than Kevin Durant, <laughs> dude. Like, I, I, I got news for you. Like, Kevin Durant, it, to me, and I'm a KD guy, sure, but I, I don't think anyone disagrees that Kevin Durant's the, mo- the, the, the easiest, most efficient, purest score in the NBA. I mean, he can dominate anybody. It, like, it's not like you want to say Giannis can get to the basket or can dominate a game. Sure, absolutely. On work ethic alone, guys like Kevin Durant and like Kobe Bryant, and again, not to keep talking about what I've done, I covered Kobe the best years of his career daily. And that guy was, he's, he's the most unique athlete I've ever seen. I mean, you got to stop comparing people to Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan. And it's, it's not a comparison. Like, I don't know how to make people understand. Like, and then Garcia's saying that AI was Mamba mentality. Guy, you don't know what Mamba mentality is. You were not even born when AI played. I mean, I, I, you have, you're crazy if you think that Allen Iverson was on Kobe's level. You're, you're you're crazy. Allen Iverson. Is... Allen Iverson was in the club every night. Do you realize Allen Iverson, by some people's measure, was a, a functioning alcoholic playing the game in the NBA? Do you understand the, the guy's personal life was a wreck? He was unprofessional. He did not practice. He did not come to shoot around. Like, are you... Do you know how many days during the NBA Finals in that series we sat around waiting for him to just show up at the arena? Like, the team would be there. He would be coming from the hotel on his own. Because he was out the night before. You have no idea what you're talking about when you talk about AI was Mamba. You're, you're, guy, you're lost. Yeah, it's not. It's not even Kobe. You're casual. I'm not even justifying that. Um, this team is hard to watch. Jackson Graham says, yes, it is. Yes, it was. Um, and Garcy says, okay, so the problem is that jazz constructed a team from a 24 year old blueprint because the Philly team is pretty much identical. It's not no, identical. It's not. Guy, it's dude, not identical. It's not. Like what? And Garcy, dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. That Philadelphia roster is nothing like this roster. They were built on bigs in defense and limited I'm I, anyway. Uh, Ty Johnson says the Nets had two superstars and couldn't win a game, uh, a single game against the Celtics. And part of that is the mental part for the for the the Nets. Kevin Durant was out of gas. He played 40 minutes pretty much every night, carried that team while while Kyrie was was not willing to get vaccinated, so he couldn't play. Then when he's able to play, Ramadan happens, and no matter what you think of his re- religion. Do you understand why Kyrie and Ramadan was an issue? Yeah, please respect my privacy. Next question. From sunup to sundown, Kyrie Irving did nothing but drink water. Because it's Ramadan, and he is fasting for Ramadan. So during playoff games, he would look gassed and emaciated, is the best word I can come up with. You saw him multiple times walk out of the locker room. He would go back to the locker room during a game, walk out of the locker room with a plate of food. Because it, it it was sundown time and he could eat. That's what Kevin Durant's dealing with. 